Donald Trump is the next president of the United States of America in what can only be called a stunning comeback. A comeback from political defeat, a comeback from a convicted felony, a comeback from an assassination attempt, and a comeback from possibly the most polarized election in the recent memory of the United States of America. I'm Bar Khadat, you're with the Mojo Story. Our focus today is in what is on what the Trump presidency means, not just for politics at home in the United States of America, which some are calling these the divided states of America, but what a Trump presidency means for India and for the world. Remember, Donald Trump's presidency will have far ranging impacts on every country, including our own. It has also raised all manners of questions on what went wrong for the Democrats. The Republican Party is in control, not just of the White House, but also of the Senate. And it's now aiming to take control of the House as well. It is what Donald Trump called a mandate for him. There are debates as to whether it is Joe Biden who wrecked the ship, whether it was Kamala Harris, whether it was something else. And that is a discussion we will have. But from the Indian perch, the prime minister has, of course, reached out to Donald Trump. Everybody remembers the Howdy Modi event. And now it was Modi's time to say Howdy Trump. The prime minister clearly enjoys a personal rapport with Donald Trump. And Indians have long argued that Republican governments have been better for Indian interests, even as Indian Americans have traditionally voted for the Democrat Party. How do we understand what's just gone down in the United States of America? The world is coming to terms with it. The Americans are coming to terms with it. But it is one of the most consequential elections in the recent political history of the United States of America. To understand it better, I want to introduce a very distinguished uh, set of guests today. Uh, joining us first up is Sri Srinivasan, my old college mate, friend, uh, but of course also the CEO of Digi Mentors and also an academic a columnist and um, a, a media host. Welcome, Sri. Also joining us is veteran diplomat Ambassador Dilip Sinha. Uh, quite a quite an interesting moment, I think, for diplomacy, and we'll get to hear more from Ambassador Sinha about that. Also joining us on the program today is Brandon Weikert. He's an author and contributor at the National Interest. Uh, remember, the media, much like in India, is also polarized. It isn't just the politicians. And we'll hear more from Brandon on that in just a moment. Salit Tripathi is with us. He's an author uh, and a journalist. Salil, it's always good to see you. Cliff uh, Smith is with us as well. Cliff Smith is a lawyer and a former congressional staffer. Welcome, Cliff. And also joining us is um, Heidi Ganhal. She's with the Republican Party. Uh, welcome, everybody. I want to start actually by playing out a very un-Trump Trump speech. Uh, he spoke of healing as he uh, declared victory. Um, I think a lot of people who've been following Trump's more contentious, controversial, divisive, and even coarse speeches would not have recognized that Trump in this Trump. Let's listen in as Donald Trump spoke about the need for the United States of America to heal. Well, I want to thank you all very much. This is great. These are our friends. We have thousands of friends on this incredible movement. This was a movement like nobody's ever seen before. And frankly, this was, I believe, the greatest political movement of all time. There's never been anything like this in this country and maybe beyond. And now it's going to reach a new level of importance because we're going to help our country heal. We're going to help our country heal. We have a country that needs help, and it needs help very badly. We're going to fix our borders. We're going to fix everything about our country. And we made history for a reason tonight, and the reason is going to be just that. We overcame obstacles that nobody thought possible, and it is now clear that we've achieved the most incredible political thing. Look what happened. Is this crazy? All right, I want to start with Heidi. You're with the Republican Party. Congratulations to you. Um, how do you explain what just happened? 
Oh, it was an amazing day yesterday. What I saw was America pushing back and saying, we love producing energy. We love producing entrepreneurship and, and free markets. We like a strong border. We like law and order. We like free speech and we love immigration. It just has to be legal. Americans are pragmatic. They want what works. And the last four years have not worked for America. So as a mom of four, three girls, and an entrepreneur, a business owner, I'm so excited for the future of America and, and that my kids will be able to live the American dream. Mm -hmm. uh, but it sounds to me like there are two Americas today, not one. Uh, and that these are not the United States of America, but the divided States of America. And that the America you describe and the narrative you offer is, of course, absolutely legitimate. Trump has fought hard and won fair and square. But that there is another America in almost like a parallel universe. What would you say to that America today? Well, I think one of the beautiful things about this win was that he built coalitions with Elon Musk and Bobby Kennedy and Tulsi Gabbard and Vivek, J.D. Vance. He brought people together of all um, political persuasions into one movement. It's really an America first movement. It's time to get America's act together and the rest of the world is watching. So I believe it is healing. It is bringing people together. We've just got some folks that haven't gotten on board yet, but once the economy gets streaming again, and the border is protected and we reject socialism in a big way through our policy, I think you're going to see the rest of the country come together. Let me take that to, uh, to Sri Srinivasan. Uh, do you, you're smiling. Uh, he's not the guy you were rooting for. Have you internalized what's happened? Yeah, I'll just uh, say that uh, I'm thinking today of Vibhuti Patel. You can see her right on the screen. This yes. uh, 82 years old. She, the, uh, she, voted for uh, Kamala Harris, not just because she was an Indian woman, but also as a, a because she was a black woman that she admired. And she oh. passed away almost two days after that. Her funeral is today. I'm wearing these Indian clothes because she wore a sari every day to Newsweek for 30 years. And I'm thinking about her and thinking about what this, what she would make of this election. To hear Heidi describe it, you would think that America was a socialist country these last four years. The Economist of all publications, conservative, fiscally conservative, said if we had a vote, we would vote for Kamala Harris. That tells you that he does have a mandate. These elections were close, but this will be seen as a mandate. But let's see if he will do what he's saying. Will he actually heal the country? But for my friends in India and everywhere in the world, know that this election has implications that directly affect you, the planet especially. You have now a chance to see if the planet can be healed at a time when it'll be very difficult to do so. There's also a success, as you see from this photograph, Barca, of storytelling. And the day this happened, you knew that this would be an iconic image that they would have forever. And this would help. Americans love a feel-good story, and this is a feel-good story that they are reacting to. But 48, 49% of the country is unhappy today, and I will see if he will be, in fact, a healer when he has shown no signs of that all of these years. Yes, but I think there is also something for the Democrats and those who support them to reflect on. Why did this happen? It couldn't only be the assassination attempt. It, is it the economy? Is it subliminal sexism against a woman candidate? Uh, is it that Kamala Harris wasn't really known to the people? Did Biden wreck the ship? Uh, is it a liberal echo chamber? There are so many theories uh, we're hearing. I just want to get Heidi to quickly react because I don't know when we lose her. She's in a moving car. What do you think it is? Why do you think the Democrats lost? Well, um, as a mom of three girls, I think one of the key things that happened was this whole movement to let biological men play in women's sports. It really upset a lot of women and um, not just Republican women, but women across the board. We worked so hard to get equality for our young girls and to see that happen was shocking. The other thing is the economy is terrible. They're trying to say that things have gotten better in the last four years. Nobody believes that. It, it's absolutely not true. Things are so expensive. Um, also, the border is a huge issue. In, in Colorado, we have um, Aurora, Colorado, where apartment buildings have been taken over by Venezuelan gang members. Crime is skyrocketing. Colorado is now one of the top um, states in the country for bad crime rates. So there's a lot going on that affects our day to day and Americans are feeling that. And again, I said they're very pragmatic. They want what works and they feel it. They know that what they're hearing from Kamala Harris or heard from her and Biden was not true. It wasn't the true reality of what they were facing every day in their lives. And they want the old America back. 
And that's what people thought about when they went into the voting box. So there's a lot to talk about, about, you know, in terms of what was the old America, what's the new America. But Ambassador Sinha, uh, this isn't just any election. This isn't only about the domestic politics of the United States of America. Um, there are going to be ripples in Europe. There are going to be debates in India. Uh, there is going to be discussion on Russia, Ukraine. Zelensky was among the first uh, to, to, to reach out to Trump to congratulate him. And Trump supporters have said that Russia, Ukraine will now be resolved in a week. Uh, Israel, Gaza is certainly going to be tougher. Netanyahu seems to have become a free agent whom uh, nobody in the United States of America seems to be able to contain or control anymore. Uh, from an Indian perspective, your take, Ambassador Sina? Well, in India, there's a lot of uh, optimism, I think, that has been uh, raised, the very high expectations of Trump. Uh, his message a few days ago uh, expressing sympathy for the plight of the Hindus in Bangladesh was very well received here. And now there is uh, hope in India being expressed that perhaps he may also start acting against the Khalistanis who have taken uh, shelter in, in the U.S. and its, and its northern neighbor. Trade is a matter of concern. Uh, I think on that we'll keep our fingers crossed. Trump is remembered for denying India. I mean, he region. called he called India an abuser on import tariffs. That's right. So that is a, that is a, that is a matter of concern. And uh, in, he had uh, denied India uh, the GSP preferential uh, benefits uh, when he was in his first term. Uh, but it is also in the geopolitical situation that that India, I think, is very optimistic. One is on the Ukraine war front. Uh, remember, mm -hmm. the Ukraine war has put India in a bind. It has to, it's been forced to choose between the U.S. and Russia, and it doesn't want to do that. So if the Ukraine war can be got over, can be put behind us, it will greatly benefit uh, benefit India. Uh, and also on the China front, if his policy is slightly tougher, he, he had it was under his first term that the Quad was revived by Shinzo Abe. So uh, it is there is optimism that the that the strengthening of the Quad under President Biden will continue. Uh, and that geopolitical uh, policy that was actually bipartisan between Trump and Biden in the Indo-Pacific will continue. So on that, all this uh, optimism, there is there is hope that uh, things will become even better in India-U.S. relations. It, it, the it, 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 is the reason for that the Indian argument that Republicans have been better for Indian interests, even while Indian Americans traditionally vote Democrats, or is it Trump specifically? Well, uh, I think Indian Indian sporting Democrats has changed considerably, and there are other people who are mighty better experts on this. But I think the Indian vote in the U.S. has has changed considerably for various reasons. But uh, you are quite right. Uh, India has had excellent relations. In fact, most of the changes have taken place under the Republicans. Although it was President Clinton who actually started the the the, the move towards improving India-U.S. relations uh, way back in the in the remember the dialogue between Strobe Talbot and uh, Just One mm -hmm. Singh. So, uh, but thereafter it was uh, Bush Jr. and then uh, Barack Obama. It's it's really bipartisan in the U.S. And that's one of the, the points of, uh, uh, of reassurance in India that uh, India-U.S. relations are, are bipartisan now. But the fact that uh, Trump has has raised this issue of the concern for the Hindus in Bangladesh and perhaps action against the Khalistanis that is very reassuring, given the fact that. Uh, the Khalistan issue has has, has bedeviled India-Canada relations for some time now. There's an interesting comment coming in on Ally Stream. India's balancing game has paid off on Ukraine and the Middle East. Too much alignment in India would have found herself lost at sea, just like Europe will be uh, will be soon. Uh, so, of course, what's what's happened at the White House, irrespective of which side of this debate you're on, is going to have massive impacts across the world. Uh, Brandon, if, if we can just come back to how this is being. Um, being analyzed at home. Uh, you know, there's a kind of mysterious Teflon quality to Donald Trump. Uh, for example, if you look at the Latino vote for the exit uh, polls, uh, there was a sense that after a very unfortunate joke was made at one of Trump's rallies in New York, uh, that coarseness would boomerang. Uh, there have been any number of other contentious controversies. Um, he's a convicted felon. Uh, you know, there are so many things I could list, um, but none of them seem to stick yeah. what do you think the other side got wrong i mean i know i know you're not a fan of the other side and that's why i'm asking you what do you think the other side got wrong 
Well, in my opinion, a lot of these these uh, controversies were contrived. I mean, ultimately, that seven hour event where one comedian made an offhanded joke about Puerto Rico was actually not widely covered. You know, the mainstream media here did not. They made a conscious effort to not cover the Trump rallies the way they did in 2016. So that actually kind of hurt them, maybe with that remark. Another point is Puerto Ricans generally uh, do not vote Republican. And so the idea that that particular group of Hispanics were suddenly going to reverse course, I think, was a little absurd. Trump has made, generally speaking, uh, major inroads with um, various minority groups. We saw, you know, increases with black males, increases with Latino males. In fact, we were talking just now with the ambassador about uh, India. Uh, I was part of the effort in 2016 to try to get out the vote with the Indian American community as well as the Polish American community, two groups that traditionally at that time were Democratic Party strongholds. And we've made we've made inroads. Plus, Donald Trump, his in terms of India, Donald Trump is probably one of the best presidents we've ever had for U.S. Indian relations. And um, the Biden administration oversaw a complete breakdown, in my opinion, of U.S. Indian relations. They got hung up on the stupid Russia, Ukraine thing uh, when they should have been focused on the big game in China. Trump is. And so all of these things are translating to Trump is a man of action. He's America's id, if we can speak in psychological terms. Uh, and that resonates with the average American far more so than, oh, he said something mean. Um, frankly, I think Americans are looking around and they're saying the cost of eggs have gone up 300 percent since 2020. Um, and as a father of three young children, I can tell you that that counts a lot more uh, for how I vote than, you know, oh, Trump said something mean. And just for the record, I am a Trump guy, love Trump. Um, but I was also because I'm a Floridian, a DeSantis guy in the primary. So I'm, I'm actually, I think, somewhat more objective in this and that I, I did support somebody else in the primary. But I am so happy that Trump won. And I think that the American people, they, they, they recognize that he's a man of action. He says things on couth. That's OK, though. Things were better under him. The Democrats completely misread the room. They talked about everything other than the economy. And that's all that really matters right now to people. OK, uh, uh, before I come to Salil and Cliff, I, Sri has to leave. Uh, so I'll just get a last word in quickly from him. What did the Democrats do wrong? You know, you said a lot about what you don't like about Trump. <laughs> uh, there are all kinds of theories. You know, did Kamala Harris not in a sense, allow herself to be known? Was this too much celebrity elitism attached to her in the last mile? Uh, was this a liberal echo chamber? Was this subliminal uh, sexism? The fact is, uh, was it Biden? You know, did, did, did the Dems lose crucial time? What was it? The very fact that this election was so close even in the polls and that Trump has won handsomely tells you that there's something about the American voter in particular, the Trump voter, that the liberals, the progressives do not know how to engage with. I'll say it's really because of the short memory. You're hearing Brandon saying how great life was four years ago. A country with 5% of the world's population had 20% of the world's COVID deaths because of Donald Trump. We saw the enormous recession that Donald Trump left Joe Biden with. The fact is that Americans are don't unnecessarily like Democrats, but they like the policies that we've been uh, seeing. We saw in multiple ballot measures, Democratic ideas won the day, but Democrats necessarily didn't win the election. So that's something to think about. Also, to our Indians who are watching, know that the Project 2025 and the mass deportations that are coming are going to affect Indians. You think that it will only affect communities that are not your own. Indian Indians constitute about the second or third rank in number of illegal border crossings. And so how do you think that's going to play in the US and what is going to happen? So we're going to pay close attention as we do with all governments and hold this government accountable as journalists do. Okay, Sri, um, stay as long as you can, uh, but I know you have to go. Salil can pick up uh, the threads of that and then we'll come to Cliff. Salil? Uh, these the divided states of America? Yes, yes. I mean, it is two countries in one, or at least two countries in one, let's put it that way. And, you know, I've been here only six years. I was in Britain for 20 years. So I see it from a different angle than Sri and others and every, 
and others are native born americans which i'm not so so with those caveats in place i do think that there are it's it's going to be a dark time ahead and it's going to be a dark time for several reasons i i see it one is internationally i mean um, i think the relationship with india will be in challenge precisely for the point she was making about the undocumented uh, uh, no, the numbers that are here in in the in the us because if that crackdown is indeed going to happen it's going to hurt uh, um uh, indian substantially significantly uh, it's something that cannot be pushed aside or brushed aside um also what it means in terms of military conflicts and so on and and tariffs is also in is an area where it is going to make things difficult for um, um for india and and the us they don't see eye to eye india has its own strategic objective india wants more visas for example and that's also going to be contentious india will want greater access to us markets that's going to be contentious and indian uh, india will impose tariffs on a lot of products the services that us would like to be opened in india india is not going it didn't do it for rishi sunak there's no reason why they should do it for donald trump okay uh, there's a lot more to talk about about what the dems got wrong but let me get cliff in uh, as well cliff uh, what's your big takeaway from the result and let's remember it's not just the white house it's also the senate and it could be the house Yeah um I think um the thing that's be- not being discussed enough um here and perhaps anywhere really is that I don't personally view this much as a Trump victory or a Harris loss I view it as a Biden loss um frankly mm-hmm. Biden um did multiple things number 1 he talked about inflation being transitory when it wasn't he passed a bill called the Inflation Reduction Act that quite clearly was not going to reduce inflation I don't think he caused inflation but i think that he made it worse he didn't handle the, he didn't even attempt to really change course on the border until 3 years into his presidency and then um it was everybody knew and keep in mind i think some of the republican complaints about biden being you know oh he was, they they were saying he was senile you know 4 years ago and all this kind of stuff um i think some of it was overblown but he clearly had lost a step he clearly was not up for the job for another 4 years everybody that was paying close attention knew it and the constant gaslighting on that point when trump you know things people raised legitimate concerns about trump but keep in mind i was one of the nikki haley voters so i wasn't going to be happy with either side winning um but um that may put in a situation where donald trump you know somebody raises a legitimate concern and trump says they're lying people believe that because they were lying about other things and whether or not that answered the question is almost beside the point and harris um for you know was saddled with all of that and she really didn't have a way out um i mean she but was... do you, but do you really think do you really think cliff if it, things would have been different had kamala harris been the nominee 2 years ago uh i think it would have been different had joe biden after the 2022 midterms announced he wasn't running again yeah i think that would have been very different um i don't know if harris would have been the nominee or somebody else i don't know if it would have changed the dynamics um I don't know if Trump would have won or lost. I do know the dynamics would have been entirely different had, you know, after the November midterms in 2022, Biden says, "Hey, look, I've had my time, I've done my thing. Heck, I beat the spread and picked up Senate seats in a midterm. I'm out." That would have changed a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. Interesting that you see it neither as a big Trump victory nor as a big Harris loss. You say Trump uh Biden is the one who who wrecked the ship uh before i actually play out another clip of donald trump and come to ambassador sina for the international implications i did you agree with that do you think things would have been different um had kamla harris been the nominee earlier or had someone else been the nominee earlier no i don't think so i think this was a firm um rebuke of the energy policies the border policies the lack of law and order the just disdain for providing law and order to citizens across the country and for the attacks on free speech i i am terrified to think what would have happened in this election if we didn't have x if elon hadn't bought twitter and given us a platform for free speech So I think it's a rejection of the socialist policies that the Democrats have gone to. It's a rejection of the woke stuff that they're pushing. It's a rejection of their immigration policies and it's a rejection of hearing them talk about things that provide no strength for America across the world. I think peace through strength is what they elected last night across the planet as you talk about international strategy. I think that uh, uh people are yearning for a strong America and Trump is seen as a strong leader that will push back on a lot of the uh, decisions that were made by the the democrat party 
Now, my question is, can Trump's presidency be predicted? Uh, is there anything predictable about Donald Trump? But before I get all of you to respond to that, <laughs> I want to play out uh, a Trump's shout out to J.D. Vance. Uh, please remember for us in India, uh, both sides had an Indian link. Uh, in fact, it's being called the proxy Chennai battle because both uh, both Kamala Harris and Usha Vance uh, have family links to Tamil Nadu. Uh, I just want to play out uh, what Donald Trump said as he uh, called out his vice president on stage. Take a look. Our great, now I can say, Vice President-elect of the United States, J.D. Vance. And his absolutely remarkable and beautiful wife, Usha Vance. And he is a feisty guy, isn't he? You know, I've said, go into the enemy camp. And you know, the enemy camp is certain networks. And a lot of people don't like to, sir, do I have to do that? He just goes, OK, which one? CNN, MSDNC? He'll say, all right, thank you very much. He actually looks like he's still like the only guy I've ever seen. He really looks forward to it. And then he just goes and absolutely obliterates them. All right. Uh, so a bit of color there. Ambassador Sinha, you said there's a lot of optimism in India when it comes to Donald Trump, even as we try and decode the reasons for the win, the defeat. Uh, from an international perspective, the one thing that Trump supporters, Tom Tom, is that he's anti-war. Uh, they've been talking about ending Russia, Ukraine within a week. Uh, Israel, Gaza, I don't actually see him being that fundamentally different from Biden-Harris. Uh, what do you see? Well, uh, as has been pointed out, he appears to be the only president in, in a number of presidents in the past, in the recent past, who did not start a new war. Uh, yeah. So there is a certain degree of, of hope there. Uh, on the Ukraine war, he has promised that he'll bring it to an end. So one hopes that he's able to succeed in that because that war is really quite very destructive, especially for us and a great foreign policy challenge for us. Uh, He'll be tough on NATO, so it's for the NATO uh, members to start worrying about and start looking around to see how they're going to respond and react to that. You're quite right. In the Middle East, his support for Netanyahu is going to be strong. Now, what impact that will have in the, in the Middle East war, uh, it's difficult to say because Netanyahu, in any case, even when Biden was trying to restrain him, wasn't restrained. So how, uh, how Netanyahu behaves now that the support of the U.S. will be a lot more uh, unbridled uh, for him uh, is is to be seen. Uh, Iran is another factor. It was remember it was uh, Donald Trump who had uh, reversed that uh, that uh, deal with with Iran. So uh, whether he'll toughen up on Iran, we don't know. But if he wants to open up to Russia and uh, and extend a hand of friendship to Putin, then I suppose on Iran also he'll have to go soft because now you have a, a, a closeness between Iran and Russia. So it it'll have to be a rather uh, geopolitical scene where uh, Trump will have to play it, it carefully. On China, uh, India hopes that he'll, he'll continue the policy of being tough on China, which means that the in, in the Indo-Pacific, he'll continue the Quad uh, the partnership and continue to strengthen it. Uh, that is a hope that, that India has because uh, otherwise that, that creates a whole lot of security challenges. But but, but, but but let me come to the operative question briefly, Ambassador Sinha, and then Cliff, Salil, uh, Brandon, and Heidi in that order. Can Trump be predicted? I mean, Trump, whom you're hoping will be tougher on China. Firstly, India and China have just had a rapprochement. Trump and China could seek to do the same. Quite possible. That's quite possible. Trump, Trump is unpredictable. Uh, yes. But uh, as I said, that is probably one of the reasons why India also uh, reached out to China and China did to India to try and ensure that that you do have a, a, a some kind of a, a hedging of of uh, of any possible change in U.S. policy. Uh, but uh, in any case, the, the real challenge uh, for the U.S. in the Indo-Pacific region is China's belligerence towards Taiwan. Uh, okay. which will have to be addressed. Uh, it does not directly concern India, but it, it does uh, concern the Quad. And that will have to be seen how, how uh, uh, the Trump uh, modulates his policy towards uh, Taiwan, whether his uh, the, check, check, the check of security that he gets to Taiwan is blanket or is he, he gets it uh, 
it makes it conditional. Ask Taiwan to start negotiating with China. I don't think that's going to be the case. Uh, in which case, on China, he'll have to uh, keep the course of being tough. Uh, Cliff, when you heard Trump's victory speech today, did he seem different or similar? I, I can't hear Cliff. Can you unmute Cliff? Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, um, a little bit, but not really. You got to remember, I mean, after his assassination attempt, he talked a lot about unity and healing and stuff too, and then went right back to the same thing. I mean, he is who he is. He's not going to change and he's not, gonna, and it's going to be the same for four more years. So I don't really think that he's fundamentally changed. Um, I do think the issue that the ambassador raised about Trump being unpredictable is a very important one. Um, a Dr. Micah Goodman, a Jewish um, educator, thought leader, said something a couple of days ago that I thought was very interesting and very um, perceptive. And that is that last time when Trump was president, when he was running in 2016 and 2020, he chose Mike Pence as his vice president. In other words, he chose an evangelical Christian who you know, had sort of the outlook of a traditional evangelical Christian from the 80s or 90s or 2000s. Um, this time he chose J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance is arguably the most isolationist um, voice in the Senate, certainly on the right. And um, so does that mean anything? Does that mean he's going to change the way he handles foreign policy? I don't know. It very well might. It could not. Um, it's difficult to say for sure. Um, you know, as um, you know, Ukraine is still an issue, Israel is still an issue. We don't know. I mean, you got to remember last time Trump was trying to please a different constituency that he felt he needed to keep. Right now, he doesn't need to do that. Um, he, you know, it's it's the second term. He's not going to run again. And, you know, he, what does he want to do? You know, he doesn't have to please anybody. So, yeah, I think it's going to be different this time. How much different? It's anybody's guess. Brandon, do you want to respond to that? Um, J.D. Vance is not an isolationist. Uh, I, I completely disagree with that take. J.D. Vance is the guy that went to, uh, was it the American? No, it was the Quincy Institute and said that, you know, Israel should be allowed to defend itself no matter what. And he aggravated everybody in that room. I think this was about a year ago. So um, I don't I don't think he's an isolationist at all. I just think he's a pragmatist and a realist, which is what one of your other guests was saying. And I, I know J.D.'s national security advisor. They are a rock solid group of people he's got around him, some of the best, brightest minds. Um, and so the, the future is very hopeful. What you can expect from a Trump Vance administration and foreign policy is very simple. It comes back to basic national interests. This country will not do anything anymore that is not in our direct national interest. So, and when, and, and that's as defined as in the Middle East, for instance, there are two issues at stake. One is ensuring Israel's survival. That is something that the Trump campaign has been very clear about from the beginning. Uh, Trump was probably the most pro-Israel president in decades. The other thing is uh, ensuring the fl free flow of oil. And so, and that is basically what we had under Trump without getting into wars. And so those things are, are achieved via the Abraham Accords, okay? We need to balance against a Iran by empowering the Sunni Arab states and Isra Israel there. In the European theater, it's very simple. We need to end the Ukraine war. And I believe Trump is going to end the Ukraine war. He's going to get them to sit at a big, beautiful table, and they're going to hash it out. Russia's going to walk away with the eastern part of the country and, the, and Crimea, and then western Ukraine will be independent. And in Asia, the key is Taiwan making sure the Chinese cannot breach into that first island chain uh, for dominance. That is essential. And so those are the three areas. And India is a key player in, I would say, all three. India could help mm -hmm. us get a deal with uh, Russia. India has those great contacts with Russia. I see that as a positive, not a negative. Um, India can help us balance against Iran. And also, India obviously can help us with Taiwan and some of the what China is doing in the Indian Ocean. And those are some of the key things. So in terms of predictability, if you think about what we define as our national interests at their core, that is what Trump will hew mostly to. And in terms of unpredictability, as one former DIA Sovietologist told me 10 years ago about Trump, the Russians and the Chinese fear Trump because they think he's kind of nuts. And we need that right now. We need less predictability in terms of the public relations side, not more. <clears throat> Um, Salil, 
Yes, I got that. Uh, Salil, Brandon says that the Russians and the Chinese think he's kind of nuts. And that's actually to America and the world's advantage. Uh, I think everybody smiled at the kind of nuts reference. Uh, but I think the argument Brandon is making is that works to his advantage and to the advantage of the United States of America. Your take. No, I do think that uh, there is an element of unpredictable, unpredictability about him, but there is also an element of predictability, predictability about him. He has said he will be tough on NATO. He will want NATO to do more. He has said that you know he is going to defend Israel. So that's uh, that's 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 not going to change anytime soon. He has said that you know he may distance himself from Project 2025, but many of the ideas in it, I mean, he has in the past shown support for that. So I think there is a lot that he has said he would do, including firing of um, uh, certain officials and, and you know appointment of certain political appointees, expecting total loyalty because the last time the problem he had was that the people he did appoint ultimately stood up to him. Several of them did, including the chief of staff and so on. And I think he will not want that. So he will want fierce personal loyalty. And so I think there are a lot of predictable aspects to it. Um, the only thing then, as I want to pick up on the point Cliff made, and this is a question, and I don't have... A, view because I'm, I'm, I am don't know enough about it. But the question is, is that you said that he will not be running again. Now, anytime an American president starts the second term, immediately newspapers start talking in terms of that now this is a lame duck presidency because he doesn't have an election to win and the party right. starts you know, jockeying for power. Barnes, of course, would want to be the legitimate inheritor. There'll be other, Nikki Haley may want to get, come in again. So what does it mean in terms of within the Republican party itself is his influence going to wane or is he going to continue to act the way he has? I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, does anybody want to take that? Uh, you know, what happens to him within the Republican Party, Brandon? He's going to have, I would argue, at least two years where he's going to be a kingmaker. But that's like every presidency. Really, you get two years and that and that's it. Now, just the point about personnel is key. The reason he really wants loyalty is because his first term, it wasn't a question of them pushing back. It was a question of them weaponizing the bureaucracy to go after him to stunt his presidency. Uh, it was a question of, of not just disloyalty, but possibly even you know something more, something maybe even criminal that was being uh, had, you know hatched against him and we saw that his first term but it, it's very clear that that for him he has two years two years to really make an impact and i think he will um and i think with vance as his number two vance and him are simpatico and so even if vance is jockeying to be the heir apparent which he is um he's mm. going to follow through on the quote-unquote maga principles much more so than a nikki haley would or or someone else who might want to be the heir apparent Okay, I want to just bring in a, a, a thread we haven't spoken about, sexism. Uh, Heidi, uh, there are those, and for us in India, you know, we had a woman as, as prime minister in the 1970s. Uh, so it's very peculiar to see that the Americans haven't yet had any woman, it doesn't matter which party, uh, who has been able to be a president. As a woman today, I know you're on the other side. Do you believe that there's still a problem with accepting uh, a woman president? No, I think it's they've oh, they've put up the wrong women. Hillary Clinton was a terrible candidate, and we did not um, see her as the right person to be the first female president of the United States. Same with Kamala. Kamala did not get one vote in the primary to become the nominee. She was placed there. She was selected to do that, and uh, she just wasn't a good candidate. It wasn't about whether she was a woman or man. It was she was not a good candidate. She didn't represent the will of the people, and it was very frustrating to see that play out. Now, I do believe America's fine with putting a woman in place, and women played a key role in getting Donald Trump elected. If you look at Susie Wiles, his campaign manager, we've got Tulsi Gabbard, we've got um, Usha was out on the campaign trail, you've got Nicole Shanahan, who was uh, RFK Jr.'s uh, VP, tremendous women around Trump, and Laura Trump, who had a huge uh, role in creating the, the momentum for the RNC. So I feel incredibly hopeful and positive about um, being a woman under Trump's administration, especially his fight for young women, like the fight for Title IX in sports, for the fight um, in defining a woman. Right now, the Democrat Party can't even define what a woman is. It's it's ridiculous. And then the Maha movement, which is the Make America Healthy Again movement, which came with RFK Jr. and Nicole, about going after the ag industry and the pharmaceutical industry to make sure our kids are eating healthy and um, that vaccinations are appropriate, et cetera. So I think it's a really special time in America to um, make sure that women have every opportunity they, they can have. And, and a healthy economy is the most important thing we can do for women. 
uh, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or an entrepreneur or a CEO, it's really, really important that we have less regulation, lower taxes, and that we have an economy that thrives so we can all do well and live the American dream. Okay, I'm not going to respond uh, to the debate around the vaccines uh, because that's a whole different debate and I have a few mi few <laughs> minutes left uh, uh, yeah. because that will just take us into a whole different direction. Uh, but uh, it's time to take last comments. So what's the one thing uh, that you'd be looking out for immediately in the first few weeks of the Trump presidency? Uh, I will end with Ambassador Sinha from an Indian perspective. I'll start with Brandon. Quickly, well, thanks. Quick thanks again. Comments. Yeah. Thanks again yeah. for having me. Uh, the thing I would be watching out for is if we can resolve the Ukraine war in the first hundred days, let's just look at that. Then we can get deals with North Korea. We can probably stabilize the situation in the Middle East, and hopefully we can kind of enhance our position in the Indo-Pacific and, and, and focus on that. If we do not get a deal on Ukraine, then everything is frozen in place and we are still in a very dangerous point. But I do believe fundamentally that Donald Trump will get the deal, and I think that once you have that deal – Everything gets a little bit better for everyone. And also, I think at home, then, we can begin nation building at home. We're going to bring industries back. And the tariffs are not going to be the end of the world for anybody. So I think we're, we're, we're on the right path, finally. Salil, what are you going to be looking out for immediately? Can we unmute Salil? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Salil. No, no, it's open now. No, I'm genuinely going to look at his appointments, the politicians that he puts around himself. Is it out of fierce, sheer personal loyalty, or is it uh, for people who are competent and who might be able to give him the alternative advice and say no when no has to be said to the president? That's not the way he likes to operate, and that's why it would be very interesting to see what happens there. Uh, uh, Cliff, uh, as a sort of Nikki Haley supporter who sort of you know feels Biden was responsible for all this, uh, what would you say to the Democrats today? Uh, yeah, I mean, they need, they do definitely need to reevaluate how they got here. I mean, I think, um, people felt that Trump's first term, um, for, had some things they liked and some things they didn't. Um, and I think though it also is viewed as chaotic and dramatic. I think that's why he lost in 2020. Um, I think that Biden promised a return to normalcy. And I think that the perception is that he didn't deliver it. You know, we had inflation that he made worse. He, mm -hmm. um, we had this, you know, issue about his competency and age that they decided to gaslight people about. And I think he that sort of baked it in the cake, you know, especially when you had the debate, the Kamala switch, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, uh, they did this to themselves. And um, both, so neither side has really been acting, in my view, like they wanted to maintain a large, durable majority. Um, there, We haven't had, I mean, Barack Obama, I believe, won 53% of the vote in 2008. That's the biggest victory we've had in an American presidential election in a long time. Um, mm -hmm. Historically, that wasn't the case. I mean, you had true landslides. You had, you know, Reagan in 84, Nixon in 72, Johnson in 64, where, you know, people won commanding majorities. And I think that yeah. in the long run is going to create problems if we keep having elections with either side winning, you know, 51% of the vote, give or take. You know, yeah. that I yeah. think that, um, that will create problems in the long run. And I think both sides do need to look at themselves, but especially, you know, look, the Democrats own this. Right. They were the incumbent party and they lost. So they're the ones that need to do a lot of introspection right now um, if they want Absolutely. to win. Absolutely. Heidi. A couple things that we need to see right away. One is opening up our energy production. Number two is uh, making a strong border, figuring out how to stop what's happening at the border and addressing the illegal immigration issue. Number three is putting law and order back in place across the country and being strong on crime. And the fourth thing is just. Um, keeping the communication open with the American people and listening and promises made, promises um, kept. That's his slogan. And I truly believe he's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. I don't, I think he's very predictable in that way. And I'm very excited to see how he um, changes things politically, internationally, and puts us back into a place of strength. Ambassador Sena, uh, India hasn't been necessarily in the best uh, phase with the United States of America. What would you be looking out for immediately? Well, immediately, I think uh, on the on the geopolitical front, if he gets the Ukraine war uh, out of the way, that really will remove one major dilemma that we face in our foreign policy. Uh, that apart, there is this there is this, this Pannu issue that's been bedeviling our relations, uh, the Khalistan issue, 
uh, I hope he gets that out of the way also because it's a completely unnecessary uh, issue. It's not a problem in India. It's become a problem in Canada. And before it becomes a problem between India and the US, I think we should get this out of the way. And thereafter, ensure that whatever technological cooperation had been set in motion by President Biden, those negotiations continue because uh, this has been a major, a very significant beginning in India-US relations. We got a lot of technological agreements uh, going. I think that is the way forward to address even the trade deficit issue, which will be very big with, with Trump. But if we can get cooperation in, in technical uh, cooperation and investment going, that will be able to mitigate a lot of the trade deficit concerns that he has. Um, well, uh, I don't know if I should end by quoting the Chinese, but I was remembering the old Chinese proverb that goes, we live in interesting times. And <laughs> that would be an understatement for a day like today. Uh, we will, as they say, watch this space uh, keenly. Uh, thank you so much to all of our uh, guests, uh, to, to Brandon Weicker, to Heidi Ganal, to Ambassador Dilip Sinha, Cliff Smith, Salit Tripathi, and earlier to Sri Srinivasan, and to our audience. You've been with us uh, all day. Thank you uh, for watching us. And uh, this is only the beginning of this story. Uh, the real story begins now in many ways. And uh, thank you, and we'll keep track of it. Thank you for watching. Take care and see you soon. It's great to see you here. Thank you for watching our work. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo's story and support independent, robust journalism.